So what happens when one of our inequalities has an absolute value in it? This happens in real analysis a lot because absolute value is the way that we measure the distance between two real numbers because the absolute value of a number is its distance from zero. Right? Uh, and so an absolute value of a difference between two numbers, absolute value of x minus y, is the distance on the real line between the number x and the number y. And since so much of calculus is about distances, right, measuring the distance between two real numbers as one of them approaches the other, those sorts of calculus ideas are all predicated on notions of distance. And so all of the theoretical underpinnings of them, the proofs and the theorems that make those calculus results possible, rely upon measurements of distance, which are absolute values. So we're going to need to know how to use absolute values in the context of a proof and when inequalities uh, are at the party. Um, so the first thing um, is to say just a quick refresher of how you would solve an inequality that has an absolute value in it. And then we'll talk about how to deploy a, a couple of inequality theorems uh, that help us to prove inequalities that have absolute values in them. Probably the most single most important tool in your analysis toolbox is called the triangle inequality. So we'll, we'll talk about that and then give you a chance to get a little practice with that too. So first, how do we solve uh, uh, an inequality that has an absolute value in it? Well, the first thing is we can't do anything until the absolute value is by itself on one side. So you know, if, if it's wrapped up in other algebra, make sure that it gets by itself first. But there's two different logical consequences for when an absolute value is bounded from above, like in this example, is less than or equal to 8, versus when an absolute value is bounded from below, greater than or equal to 3, for example. Because an absolute value measures distance, the statement over here on the left is saying that the distance between 5x and negative 12 is bounded from above by 8. So 5x is no more than 8 units away from the number negative 12. So since my distance is being hemmed in, I'm going to expect that my answer to this inequality is going to be a bounded interval, right? It's like we only give x uh, a certain leash through which the dog can sort of run around and it can't go any further away than that leash lets it go. That's what happens when an inequality is uh, with an absolute value is bounded from above. It constrains us such that our solution is probably going to be a bounded interval of the real numbers. Whereas in this example, we're saying exactly the opposite. We're saying that x cannot get any closer to the number 8 than three units. So x has to be at least three units away from eight. So it's bounding x away from something rather than bounding it inward towards something. So what we expect is to have uh, an unbounded pair of intervals, a uh, union of an unbounded pair of intervals uh, that's going to be the solution set to this. So what does this look like in the algebra when we actually solve it? Well, a less than or equal to, usually the shorthand that we use for this is we break it out into a compound inequality less than or equal to, less than or equal to. We remove the absolute values from the middle, 5x plus 12. And we agree that this inequality is going to be satisfied whenever 5x plus 12 is itself less than or equal to positive 8, the upper bound, but would also be satisfied whenever 5x plus 12 is greater than or equal to the opposite of 8. So whenever we're bounding an absolute value from above, we can break it into one of these sort of three-part inequalities. And then we can just endeavor to solve this three-part inequality using our usual set of solving an inequality steps. Namely, I would subtract 12 from all three pieces of this compound inequality. And since f of x equals x minus 12 is an increasing function, that's going to preserve the sense of all my inequalities. Don't have to reverse my inequalities. And then I'll divide by 5, which since f of x equals x over 5 is also an increasing function. I also keep my inequality symbols the same way. My x stands alone. I'm going to get negative 4 fifths over here on the top. And I'm going to get negative 20 divided by 5, negative 4 down here on the bottom. So now we've solved this inequality. If we wanted to, we could write as a solution set that x must belong to the set negative 4 to negative 4 fifths as an interval of the real numbers inclusive of both endpoints. So I'm using square brackets here because both x equals negative 4 and x equals negative 4 fifths are a part of my solution set. So that's how to do it when your inequality is bounded from above. When your inequality is bounded from below, and we're trying to keep x at least three units away from 8, it's like a, it's like a restraining order in a way, right? x cannot get any closer to 8 than three units. And so what happens here is that it breaks into, again, 
a pair of inequalities. But instead of those inequalities being joined together by the implicit logical and that comes with this triple inequality, this time it gets connected by the logical or. And we have 8 minus x in both cases, 8 minus x. So this inequality will be satisfied if 8 minus x itself is greater than or equal to 3. But it would also be satisfied if 8 minus x is less than or equal to negative 3. So notice in both cases what ended up happening is we just took this, this constant that was on the other side, and we had both itself and its opposite as part of our inequality. And when we put in its opposite, the sense of its inequality symbol just reversed. Right? And the only big difference between this example and this one is that we have an, a logical or here instead of a logical and, which is a subtle difference, but it's an important one logically. And then we would just solve each one of these inequalities uh, in its own right. Subtracting 8 from both sides, which does not reverse the inequality. Minus x is less than or equal to negative 3 minus 8 is negative 11. And then multiplying both sides by negative 1, which is a decreasing operation. f of x equals minus x is a decreasing function. And so I do need my inequality to flip. When I apply that last step, x greater than or equal to 11. Do the same process for the other inequality. Subtracting 8 is going to give me a negative 5 over here, minus x is greater than or equal to minus 5. And then, again, when I multiply both sides by negative 1, that is a decreasing operation. The sense of my inequality reverses x less than or equal to 5. And so the solution set of this inequality is all the x's greater than or equal to 11, together with all the x's that are less than or equal to 5. And so as a, a, a union of two intervals, that would be the interval from minus infinity to 5, inclusive of 5, and the interval from 11 to positive infinity, inclusive of 11, union together. And so the solution set for that inequality has these two unbounded pieces of the real line, uh, going from 11 up to positive infinity and going from 5 down to negative infinity. And so that's how we solve uh, uh, absolute value inequality. But that's, again, often not what we end up doing in real analysis. In real analysis, we often have to substantiate absolute value inequalities as part of a proof. So they might look something more like what we have written down here, kind of one of these if-then statements. Let's suppose that we want to prove that if x is greater than or equal to 4 in absolute value, then we are guaranteed that the absolute value of 5x plus 12 is less than or equal to 8. And so if we didn't know any better, what we would probably do is just solve the inequality the way that we did up here and then try to draw the conclusion, oh, if x is greater than or equal to 4 in absolute value, um, sorry, that inequality symbol is going the wrong way, typo. Not my first typo today, but we do need to fix it. Less than or equal to 4. Um, and we would just say, well, if absolute value of x is less than or equal to 4, then we know that in particular um, it would be you know, a part of this uh, interval and we'd be able to make this conclusion. But what it looks like in real analysis is often different. So when we try to do a proof of this, what we start with, if we're going to do a direct proof, right, is we'll start with the statement where we stipulate, assume, that the absolute value of x is, greater, is less than or equal to 4. And so now, what we want to do is to try to justify why the absolute value of 5x plus 12 is less than or equal to 8. And so, like good students of, of proving inequalities, we would start with that left-hand side, the way that we talked about in our first video today. I would start with the absolute value of 5x plus 12. And I want to try to take a bunch of steps that show that I can get that quantity to be less than or equal to 8. The problem is that I don't know anything about the absolute value of 5x plus 12, but I do know something about the absolute value of x, right? Because that was my assumption here. So what I need is a tool that can let me go inside those absolute value signs and break apart the absolute value over this plus that I have here in the middle, right? I don't want that plus. If I can get something like the absolute value of 5x by itself, we can work with that. But 5x plus 12, we can't do anything with. So we want something that can break apart a plus or a minus inside an absolute value. And that is what the triangle inequality does for us. The triangle inequality tells me that for any real numbers x and y, the absolute value of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. 
Again, this is probably the A number one most important tool in your real analysis toolbox. You're going to write a lot of proofs using the triangle inequality at some point uh, during the semester. So let's see if this triangle inequality can help us. If I were to apply it to the absolute value of 5x plus 12, what it would tell me is that the absolute value of 5x plus 12 is less than or equal to. And that's good, by the way, right? Because I'm trying to replace this with something bigger, with something bigger, with something bigger, because ultimately I need to show that it's less than or equal to something. So this inequality is going in the right direction for what we want. And now applying the triangle inequality, we'll know that that's less than or equal to the absolute value of 5x plus the absolute value of 12. And that's super good now, because I have my x in its own term with its own absolute value right now which will be helpful because we should ultimately be able to apply this assumption to it. Well, the absolute value of 12 is just 12. So we don't have to worry about that term on the end uh, having any sort of weirdness. I'm just going to put an equal sign here for a minute. Absolute value of that 12 is equal to 12. What about the absolute value of 5x? Well, one of the properties that absolute values have in real numbers is that they are multiplicative. The absolute value of a product is exactly equal to the product of the absolute values. So the absolute value of 5x is equal to the absolute value of 5 times the absolute value of x. right? But the absolute value of 5 is just 5, because 5 is 5 units away from 0 on the number line. And so now that I have the absolute value of x by itself, now we have our magical assumption. I can use my assumption. right? By my assumption that absolute value of x is less than or equal to 4, oh, and now I see that I've got maybe a problem with this. Um, but let's forge ahead for the moment. This is less than or equal to 4. And so therefore, this is less than or equal to, whoops, I'll try and keep my color coding, less than or equal to 5 times 4. plus 12. And I've got a problem, <laughs> right? Uh, because 5 times 4 plus 12 is not, in fact, um, less than or equal to 8. So I screwed something up here. Um, <laughs> and you might be able to tell why it is that this didn't work. Uh, what does this end up being? 32. Yeah. So maybe you can tell why this didn't work. Because uh, there are values of x that are less than 4 in absolute value that don't actually belong to this solution set that we discovered up here. Um, so yeah, so I messed that up. What I meant to put, I think what I meant to put here was negative 4, uh, was 4 fifths rather than 4. Um, so let's rewind the tape <laughs> real quickly. And I'm just going to make that correction. Uh, so we'll see how this proof was actually supposed to have worked. So yeah, my apologies on this one. I had written the statement of this problem incorrectly. What we wanted was 32 here and not 8. Um, so of course, you all can't change the problems when you're solving them <laughs> analysis. But you know, uh, as an instructor writing a problem, I wrote one that didn't work. So let's change it to one that did. The important part is the structure of the proof. right? We started out with absolute value of 5x plus 12, which we didn't know anything about. But we made an assumption about the absolute value of x. And our tool for turning the expression absolute value of 5x plus 12, which is unknown, into an expression that involves the absolute value of x, which we do know, is the triangle inequality. It lets us break apart an absolute value over a sum. Right? The absolute value of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. And now reading this from left to right, absolute value of 5x plus 12 is less than or equal to less than or equal to 32, which is you know what I should have written as the original problem. So what's different if we don't want a less than or equal to here, but we want a greater than or equal to? Let's suppose I'm trying to establish that absolute value of 8 minus x is greater than or equal to 3 if I know that absolute value of x is greater than 11. Right? We need a different kind of triangle inequality called the reverse triangle inequality. And the reverse triangle inequality tells us something about the absolute value of a difference, x minus y, rather than the absolute value of a sum. It says that the absolute value of the difference of x and y is greater than or equal to the difference between the absolute values of x and the absolute values of y, but with an extra set of absolute value symbols on the outside of it, because we don't necessarily um, if absolute value of x minus absolute value of y is, is negative, we want to flip that so that it's positive, so that we're saying something interesting. Um, otherwise, we could end up with this thing on the right-hand side being negative. And of course, we know the absolute value of something is going to be greater than or equal to a negative quantity. So to make it say something more profound, we have this extra set of absolute values on the outside. This is the reverse triangle inequality. So let's use that to prove this last example, which definitely does work. Um, 
that if the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 11, so that's going to be the thing that we stipulate. That's going to be what we assume to be true. And we want to try to prove that absolute value of 8 minus x is greater than or equal to 3. So we'll start by making the assumption. Assume that we know that the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 11. And now, dutifully, we will try to work from the left side of this inequality which we're trying to prove and make it arrive at the right-hand side. So the absolute value of 8 minus x. And we want to show that somehow this is greater than or equal to 3. So we have to get from here to there. How do we do it? Let's apply the reverse triangle inequality, which we would do because we have a subtraction in here. So that, that's one clue. But the more important clue is that we're trying to bound this absolute value from below. We want a greater than or equal to here, and not a less than or equal to. And so the reverse triangle inequality that has the greater than or equal to on this side of the absolute value is the one that we know that we should use. So the absolute value of 8 minus x is greater than or equal to, according to the reverse triangle inequality, this one. It's going to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of the absolute value of 8 minus the absolute value of x. So you're going to end up with a lot of vertical lines, and it's going to look a little bit confusing at first. Um, but let's simplify it just a little bit. The absolute value of 8 is just 8. And so we can just write 8 minus the absolute value of x. But now we want to do a little bit more thinking, right? Because we have this big set of absolute value bars on the outside that we want to try to do something with, right? Um, let's go back to our assumption. We know the absolute value of x is at least 11. So if I take 8 and subtract a number, which is at least 11, we know for sure that 8 minus something which is bigger than 11 is going to be a negative real number. And so the absolute value of a negative quantity is the opposite of that quantity. Right. So the absolute value of 8 minus the absolute value of x is going to be equal to the opposite of 8 minus the absolute value of x. Right. Because 8 minus that thing is negative. And so the absolute value of 8 minus that thing is going to be the opposite, the positive version of 8 minus the absolute value of x. And so when I distribute this minus sign, I'm going to get absolute value of x minus 8 instead of 8 minus the absolute value of x. And now we have the absolute value of x right where we want it. Because we happen to know something about the absolute value of x. We assumed that it was greater than or equal to 11. And so now we can apply that assumption. This absolute value of x is greater than or equal to 11. And therefore, absolute value of x minus 8 is greater than or equal to 11 minus 8. And 11 minus 8 just happens to be 3. And if I read this inequality from left to right, we've proven exactly what we set out to prove. The absolute value of 8 minus x is greater than or equal to, and at every step, we replaced this with either something which was less than or equal to it, or something which is equal to it. So all my inequality symbols are going in the same direction, which is always what we need when we're solving an inequality. Absolute value of 8 minus x is greater than or equal to something which is equal to something which is greater than or equal to something which turns out to be 3. And that completes the proof. So these are just the extra steps that you have to do when the absolute value comes to the party, right? Is that if you're solving an inequality, break it apart into a compound inequality and solve each of those pieces individually. But more frequently in real analysis, when you're using an absolute value inequality in a proof, the triangle inequality and its alter ego, the reverse triangle inequality, are your friends, right? Anytime you're trying to establish uh, an inequality that has an absolute value bounded from above, so less than or equal to right here. The triangle inequality, the original one, is your tool. So that's what we did here, right? Absolute value of 5x minus 12 is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. And on the, when the shoe is on the other foot, and we want to bound an absolute value from uh, below, so I have a greater than or equal to sign here, then the reverse triangle inequality is what you can try to use to bail yourself out, uh, which is a little bit more complicated than the original, but it's just the tool that we needed uh, for this last example.